shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually have somebody in the audience who knows vastly more about this than I do, who is Professor Thomas Groom, uh, who's actually been involved quite closely uh, with helping the dialogue between the church and President Obama. I don't know whether, Tom, you'd like to come up and say a little word. I, Tom's driving me back to Boston College this evening, so I hope he's still going to do it after I've summoned him up. But why, why say something when you've got somebody in the audience who knows more than you do? Well, hardly. Well, thank you, Timothy. I'm just the bag carrier tonight, so I was just, I brought Timothy down and I bring him back. I also just broke into a summer cold, even while we were having a lovely uh, dinner uh, at the rectory this evening. So if I sound <clears throat> unsonorous, it's because of the cold. Um, I, I really appreciate what, what Timothy has said about the dialogue. There has to be a dialogue. And I think there is a great openness and a possibility of a dialogue that this man, on many, many issues, really embraces Catholic social teaching, or what we would recognize as Catholic social teaching. I suppose the one fault issue that we come back to is the issue of abortion. And, and issues like uh, stem cell research. But on those issues, uh, he seems to be in a position where, um, where he's not opposed, or I suppose if we cannot, as Catholic Christians, get to a point where we get our country to ban all abortions, and, uh, and many Catholics would not be in favor of that anyhow, at least without any condition whatsoever. In other words, to send it back to the back alleys of our, of our country. If we cannot get a majority of our country to vote for that, then what do we do instead? Well, we can stick our head in the sand and say, uh, you know, we'll hold out for absolute fulfillment of the totality of a Catholic moral principle, uh, or we will do the best we can in the meantime. And of course, uh, Aquinas and all the great Catholic theologians and ethicists will advise us to always choose the greater good and the lesser evil. And the lesser evil and the greater good surely by far is to reduce the number of abortions in our country. And he's deeply committed to doing that. And I have seen, and I haven't been, I was a very minor, minor minor, minor, minor uh, part of the conversation and toward the end of the campaign there are other Catholic ethicists and theologians that have far more significant participation than I had but um, I saw a real evolution in his position because at the beginning of the campaign uh, he was rather, I would say rather unsophisticated around the issue of abortion. Now he's moved to a firm position of being deeply committed to reducing the number of abortions in our country. The point is that it can be done. The Dutch have one-third of our abortion rate. The Germans have one-third. The Swedes have one-half. Uh, so, and they have reduced the number by having good social programs, good prenatal, natal, and postnatal care, especially for people who have an unplanned pregnancy or an unwanted pregnancy. There's a direct correlation in our country between poverty and abortion. A woman below the poverty line is 300% more likely to have an abortion than a woman above it. So to give good social programming to people people, uh, especially poor women and poor uh, families that have an unplanned or an unwanted pregnancy, to give them the resources of the prenatal, the natal, the postnatal care, and uh, an incentive then for adoption. The Dutch are, have adoptions at a rate of which we, have, we, we used to have in this country one time, but they have it again because they're giving ta tax incentives to adoptive parents. I happen to be an adoptive parent myself. It's almost impossible to adopt in this country unless you're quite wealthy. Uh, it costs twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand dollars to adopt a baby, and even at that, many of us wait for years and years before we're so blessed. And to, to to return to a situation where we're preventing abortions and promoting adoptions, to me, in the meantime, regardless of where one comes down on this issue, seems a far more uh, Catholic posture to take. I've totally been bewildered by our bishops who have said, who have implied that if you're a good Catholic, you had to vote for John McCain in the last election. Uh, because Mc John McCain, in fairness to him, never ever said that he would be overthrow Roe v. Wade or that he would put in place social programs to reduce the number of abortions. Uh, I mean, the man has been elected, so I'm not giving an election speech. So that I think to work with him, he's going to be our president uh, for the next, would God spare him for the next uh, certainly six, for three, four, another three and a half years, probably for another seven and a half years. So it would seem terribly foolhardy for us to take this over against posture, especially on the issues on which we can certainly work with them, and I would even include abortion in that issue.
I choose my bag carriers very carefully. Uh, I'm Evil Garrigan, and uh, looking at the statistics of birth rates in Europe, and where Christendom has great power, and the birth rate falling so much, and the increase of Islam coming into it, and you talked about having a dialogue with them, and then there are some statistics that are out there that the greater the percentage of population they achieve in a community, the more they want to push everybody into the Shia law. Do you have any thoughts about that, how this will move forward, and how we can use Catholicism to help ourselves? I think there are, there are two related issues there, uh, that of, uh, of the declining rate of, of birth. And it's funny that you get that particularly uh, in Catholic countries, Spain, Italy, and in Canada, Quebec. Uh, um, why do we have this drop in the, in, in the birth rate? Japan is actually also another example, they're not Catholic. Uh, and I think very often it's, it's a loss of hope. Uh, I think for young people, the future is very unsure. Uh, and you wonder what lies ahead. You've obviously had the financial meltdown recently. But far more, we've got uh, the biggest challenge, which I haven't mentioned this evening, that's always in my mind, which is of imminent ecological catastrophe. Uh, that our planet will suffer a terrible ecological crisis is almost unavoidable. We can take swift action to perhaps reduce it, but it's likely that many millions of people will die unless we do something. I think there is absolutely a consensus among scientists about that. So I think that this is a moment when it, it's people sometimes hesitate to, to bring young people into the world. So what we have to do is to communicate a strong sense of Christian hope. We've had this, this, this confidence in progress. It's been the secular faith of the last two or three hundred years. And we've lost confidence largely in anything other than a narrowly scientific progress. So what we have to do is find ways of sharing our hope, Christian hope, with the young. And that will encourage, I think, us to, have the, to, to bring young people into the world. We don't know what lies ahead. But we do believe that, that uh, any human being that comes to, to birth is made for happiness in God. And that gives us confidence, I hope should give us confidence to have children for the future. Now, if we look at Islam, uh, I think Islam contains many strands. There are many forms of Islam. Just about a, a month ago, we had the Secretary General of the Muslim General Council of Great Britain to speak at Blackfriars, where I live, to give a lecture for a, a small group of people. And there was another Muslim in the audience who profoundly disagreed with him. I wasn't surprised. This happened to every meeting that I've ever been to a dialogue with Islam, with, with Muslims. And I think Islam is at a, a state uh, where it could evolve in many ways. It's facing, in a way, the crisis of the Enlightenment as we have had to. And I think we can part of the service that uh, Catholics can offer is we can share with Muslims our lessons, what we have learnt in confronting some of the challenges of modernity. For a long time we resisted, for example, historical criticism of the Bible. We were terrified. You know, that it would mean the end of any authority of the Bible. This has not turned out to be the case. And for many young Muslims now, that's a crucial issue. Can they read the Quran in the light of, of the history of its evolution and its genesis? Uh, we have something to, to offer them. So I think that our primary reaction to uh, Islam 